play like devil's advocate. But um, but I'll play devil's advocate. Yeah, no, this. Is... <laughs> but, um, like it seems to me like if you, I mean, if someone else fights you, and if you fight back, and if they fight back again, and you fight back again, it's like a, it's like a cyclical process. You know, like there's no real, like resolution. Everyone's fighting, and um, like you fight back, they fight back, you fight back, they fight back. All right, is, is, and this is why we need, we need principled people. And this is why Islam is encouraging us not to divorce our fighting from ethical and moral considerations. And I think the case you're making is not historically verified. In the case of the advent of Islam, okay, uh, the, the Quraysh or the people who are fighting the Muslims, they, they launched their attacks, and the Muslims reciprocated. But this came to an end. And at a certain point, there was no more fighting. And then there was room for dialogue. And the same thing in Europe, OK? The British and French fought the Germans. And the Germans reciprocated. And now there's no more fighting. And I think that you would have to be extremely pessimistic to think that World War III is going to occur between the French, the English, against the Germans, unified or not, a unified Germany or not. So I, I think that at a certain point, there's resolution. And then there is a room, there's, a, 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 there's room for reflection. And if we reflect during those uh, interims under the right circumstances, we can transcend the roots of conflict. And I think this is what happened in the struggle between the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Quraysh, or those who were fighting against him. And in recent history, I think this is what has happened in Europe. And I think there are many other historical examples. So I think that uh, this idea that conflict and struggle is the norm in human societies has to be challenged. I think it's the exception. There are indeed many uh, conflicts raging amongst human beings today. But do they involve the majority of, of uh, nations and society and states or a small minority? They involve a small minority. And I think this has always been the case. So I think the challenge for us as enlightened human beings, especially in these times we live in where war is potentially so destructive, even by so-called non-conventional means. As the Gulf War show, they have now vapor bombs that have the, uh, the power of a small thermonuclear device. And they use these in the desert against those hapless Iraqis. Uh, they have now concussion weapons that can scramble the brains of whole armies without even obliterating their bodies. And they use these in Panama. They found mass graves in Panama where the bodies were totally intact, but the brains of the people had been so severely concussioned that, that they died. They're working on radiation weapons. They're working on all sorts of terrible instruments of destruction. So as Muslims and enlightened Muslims and non-Muslims, we have to seriously uh, discuss ways to resolve potential conflicts peacefully and definitively and create a harmonious situation because I, we're reaching a point we can't afford wars because of the potential destructiveness and the uh, lack of adequate defenses. You see now the uh, Pentagon recently canceled a massive howitzer order. Uh, because we don't need cannons anymore. Who needs cannons? We can push a button and scramble a million brains. So, you know, howitzers are becoming obsolete. So, if with the, the, the way technology is developing, uh, we need to respond with a, a, a commensurate uh, ethical and moral initiative. Uh, so, I don't think that this scenario of violence retaliation is inevitable. I don't think that it's historically uh, verified. And I don't think it's a premise that we 
as Muslims or non-Muslims, should accept in trying to formulate strategies to deal with each other. Uh, 